I never would have guessed in a million years that this is how we were gonna spend Easter together. But I am so thankful that you're watching today and I'm so thankful that God's given us an opportunity through technology to connect to his word and connect his people to his church. If you have a copy of God's word today, I wanna to invite you to open to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, we're gonna spend the majority of our time in that chapter today. As you're turning there, let me just tell you, I heard a story not long ago about a man that went on vacation to the Middle East. He was with his wife and he was also with his mother-in-law. And like many men, he had a relationship with his mother-in-law that was a little bit complicated at best. Well, during their vacation, they were in Jerusalem and something tragic happened and his mother-in-law ended up passing away. They met with the American consulate and they were told that they really had two options. First of all, they could ship the body back to the United States, but it was gonna cost them roughly $5,000 to do that. But then they were given a second option and they were told you could just bury the body here in the Holy Land and it would only cost you about 150 bucks. After thinking through their options, the man quickly decided that he was willing to pay the extra money to ship the body back to the United States. The representatives over there heard that and they were shocked. They said, man, you must love your mother-in-law a lot if you're willing to spend $5,000 just to ship her body back instead of just paying your 150 bucks and being done with it here. The man responded and said, no, listen, that's not it at all. In fact, the reason I'm doing this is because I heard about a story about a man that was buried here in Jerusalem a long time ago and he resurrected from the dead. He said, I'm just not willing to take that chance with my mother-in-law. Can I just tell you today, Jesus is alive. Would you say that with me? Jesus is alive. Say it out loud, ready? Jesus is alive. He didn't stay in the grave. Like they told him in Matthew chapter 28, verse six, he is not here for he is risen just as he said. That's why Easter is the greatest celebration on our calendar today. It's because nations come and go. Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. Leaders live and leaders die, but only one thing is for certain and will never change. And that is Jesus is alive. He has risen from the grave and he is with us even today. You know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, by this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word, I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was raised on the third day. That reminds us, Jesus came and Jesus died. Jesus was buried but Jesus came back to life. And Paul said, by the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're saved. You may need to be reminded today who this Jesus really is. May I remind you? He's the maker of heaven and earth. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the son of the living God, the humble spirit, the man of sorrows, the prince of peace, the wonderful counselor. He's the good shepherd, he's our sinless savior the resurrection and the life, the lamb of God. He's a friend to sinners. He's the great high priest, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, the one who is glorious and gracious and generous and good. He's the one who died for our sins. And yes, he's the one who rose from the grave. And he's the one that we are celebrating today. Can somebody get a little bit fired up? It's Easter Sunday. Listen, the resurrection of Jesus changed everything. It changed history. This morning, we're not talking about a man that was resuscitated or revived. We're talking about the son of God that died a death that you and I deserved. And he was resurrected in order to save us. Understand the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what gives us hope today. And I don't know about you, but I need to be reminded of that hope from time to time. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse three, it says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That says, because Jesus rose again, we have a living hope. Jesus is alive. And he alone is our source of hope. And listen, I may not know every person watching online today, 
but I do know something about you. I know that God created you in such a way where you have a longing for hope. Someone once said that a man can live 40 days without food. He can live eight minutes without air. He can live three days without water. But he can't live a single second without hope. Where does your hope come from? Be honest with that question today. Is your hope in your financial security? Is it in the money in your bank account? Do you have hope today because you have good health or because you've made good grades or because you've received accolades throughout your entire life? Is your hope placed in a political party or is it placed in a presidential candidate? What is your hope in right now? Let me just tell you, that hope is going to fall short every single time because the hope God intends for you to have is a hope that is only found in the person of Jesus Christ. Some of you would say, man, I'm watching this morning and if I'm being completely honest, my hope tank is completely empty. Maybe you're thinking, I don't know what it feels like to have hope, but I do know what it feels like to be discouraged. I can tell you what it feels like to be disappointed. I can give you all kinds of examples of what it is to be defeated. Can I just remind you, Satan came to defeat you. That's his entire purpose. But Jesus came to save you. Satan came to steal your joy, but Jesus tells us he came to give you life. Read, for, read John chapter 10, verse 10 with me. Jesus said, a thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. You need to hear this today. Jesus loves you. I know that sounds so elementary, but you need to process the magnitude of that statement for a second. He loves you. He died for you. He defeated death and rose again for you. And Jesus came to save you and to give you life and to give you joy and to give you peace. And he came to give you hope today. Why? Because he loves you. The Bible tells us that nothing can separate us from his love. I love that verse in Romans chapter eight, verse 37. He says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And what a great reminder on this incredible weekend that nothing can separate me from God's love, nothing. And perhaps you're watching today and you're thinking, man, I just don't have that assurance. I don't have that confidence. I don't have the hope that you're talking about right now. There may be several people watching today that when it comes to hope, they're just out. If you have your Bible today, or maybe even a Bible app, I want to invite you to join me in turning to the book of Luke. The book of Luke, it's one of the four gospels that's right there in the front of your New Testament. And I want you to turn to Luke chapter 24. And as we open up God's word, I want us to look at a story in this book about two of Jesus's disciples that had lost their hope as well. You know, in verse 13, it says that same day, two of Jesus's followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. I really want you to focus on those first three words. It says that same day. Now, what day is that talking about? Can I tell you? The day that that's talking about is the original Easter Sunday. And where were they going on that day? Check it out. They were walking away from Jerusalem. They were leaving. They were defeated, they were depressed, they were overcome with hopelessness. You see, these two disciples, one of them was named Cleopas, the other one doesn't even have a name mentioned. But these two disciples were two of the 120 followers of Jesus in that day. They would have been there when Jesus was beaten, they would have been there to experience the crucifixion, they would have been there when his body was buried. On Friday, they were disciples of Jesus. But now it was Sunday and they were doubters of Jesus. It had been three days and nothing had happened. In their mind, Jesus was dead and he didn't do what he told them that he was gonna do. So now they were fleeing Jerusalem. 
They wanted to get as far away from that bloody cross as possible. But the Bible goes on to say that as they were on this journey to Emmaus, a stranger joined them on the road. At least they thought he was a stranger. Read with me, beginning in verse 14. It says, together they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. Then he asked them, what is this dispute that you're having with each other as you were walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. The one named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? What things? He asked them. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. You know, it's interesting to me that Jesus chose to make his post-resurrection appearance to these two disciples. One of them was Cleopas, and the other one goes unnamed. I mean, we don't even know these people. If I were Jesus, I think I would have appeared to some more important people in the beginning, at least. I would have showed up to Pilate, who had just washed my hands of the decision to crucify me three days earlier, and I would have been like, hey, what's up, Pilate? I'm back, right? I would have appeared to guys like Caesar, who believed that he was a god, and I would have said, hey, Caesar, get you some of this. I'm here, right? And then I would have probably talked a little bit of smack to him, if I'm just being honest. A little bit of trash talk in that setting would go a long way. You just imagine saying to Caesar, hey, in a couple thousand years from now, the only thing you're going to be known for is a haircut and a salad, but I am going to change human history. But Jesus didn't do that. He, did, he didn't appear to the elite. He didn't talk any smack. Instead, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene. I'm not sure exactly why. Maybe it was because she was the last one at the cross and the first one at the empty tomb. I'm not real sure, but it's interesting, isn't it? But then we see he appears to these two, these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And I guess what I'm trying to, to point out here is very simple. Jesus came to save ordinary people. Some of us just can't wrap our minds around the fact that Jesus came to save us. Um, let me just put this into perspective for you today. How many of you were the valedictorian of your senior class? Just go ahead and raise your hand. How many of you were an all-American athlete? and you're being recruited by the best of the best. Just raise your hand right there in the privacy of your own home. I can't see your hands through the screen today, but I'm guessing that we have a lot of losers watching this today. I'm just, I'm just saying, and guess what? I'm right there with you. The whole world is full of losers, and Jesus came to give hope to all of us. Cleopas was out of hope. And he said in verse 21 that he was hoping that Jesus was the Messiah and that he was the one who came to redeem Israel. You remember that verse? I want you to notice it was written in the past tense. Why? Because he was out of hope. So what did Jesus do? Keep reading in verse 25. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. When they were hopeless, Jesus took them to the truth of God's word. And that's what Romans chapter 15 verse four shows us. It says, for whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction so that we may have hope through endurance, and through the encouragement from the scriptures. The truth of God's word brings hope to the hopeless. I want to say that again. The truth of God's word will bring hope to the hopeless. He, he gets in their face a little bit here, and he says, why don't you have any hope? 
Don't you remember what the word of God says? Don't you remember what I've told you? Listen, we don't know exactly what Jesus quoted that day, but it says that he took them through all the writings of Moses and all the prophets. As I think about that, I can just imagine him walking through Psalm 22. Remember when it said that the Messiah would be mocked and how he would divide up his clothes and how his bones would be out of joint and how his hands and his feet were going to be pierced? Do you remember what it said? Remember 700 years ago when Isaiah wrote Isaiah 53 and he said the Messiah would be despised and rejected by mankind, a man of sorrow and familiar with pain? Remember when it said that he would be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities? And it talked about how he would receive the punishment that would ultimately bring us peace? Jesus was saying, wake up. That's talking about me. After this happened, the Bible says Jesus unveiled their eyes and he allowed them to recognize him. And after he did that, the Bible says he disappeared. Verse 32 says, they said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? I want you to notice a couple of things in this very text. As their ears Listen to the truth. The Bible says their hearts were burning in their chest. As their eyes were being exposed to reality, their hearts were being restored to hope. Verse 33 says that very hour, they got up and they returned to Jerusalem. They were running away from Jerusalem, completely hopeless. And then in a moment, God restored their hope they did a complete 180 and went the opposite direction. Here's the takeaway I wanna leave with you today. The truth in their heart changed the direction of their feet. And as a result, their doubt was replaced with hope. Maybe you would say today, I don't have that hope. Can I tell you? Go to God. Don't run away from him, run to him. Go to God with your hurts today, your hangups, your complaints, your concerns. Go to God and remember, he loves you. His arms stay open and they're ready to embrace you. He wants to give you hope today, not a hope so kind of hope. God wants to give you a no so kind of hope. The kind of hope that forgives, the kind of hope that gives you peace and assurance, the kind of hope of heaven. And listen, that kind of hope is only available through the person of Jesus Christ. King David said in Psalm 39, seven, my hope is in you. You know why we can put our trust in him today? Jesus said it of, of himself in John 14, six. He said, because I am the way, I'm the truth, I am the life, because no one comes to the father except through me. That's why, that's why you can put your hope in me. Jesus said, hope is available, but it is only available through me. Maybe you're like Cleopas today and you're doubting Jesus. You're doubting that Jesus can save you. You're thinking about all the times that you've disappointed him, all the times you've sinned, all the times you've fallen short and you're thinking, I've done too much, I've gone too far, I've been too bad. Jesus can't save me. Can I just tell you with all the love in the world, that if that is your thought today, you are completely wrong. I love the story that's told in Acts chapter two. I love verse 21 that says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's no doubt they will be saved. I love that, but it's the following verses that blow my mind. Verse 22 begins with Peter. He's talking to the crowd and he says, fellow Israelites, listen to these words. Let me translate that to today. He's saying, hey, don't miss this. Put your phone down. Stop taking pictures. Get off of Instagram. Stop scrolling through your Facebook feed. Pay attention to what I'm about to tell you because this is very important. You ready? Verse 22. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan 
and foreknowledge. He was saying this to the crowd that day. You know Jesus. You know him. I don't have to introduce you to him because you know him. You've seen his miracles. You've experienced the signs. And then he says, Jesus was handed over to them. And this was all a part of God's deliberate plan. This says that God has foreknowledge, right? And I don't know about you, but that makes me feel a whole lot better about our future today. That God knows what's going on. This whole circumstance is not one that takes him by surprise. This tells us that we don't have to predict the future. We don't have to worry about what the future holds. Why? Because we know the one who holds the future. But look at what he just said to these people. In verse 23, he goes on to say, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by death. Not only is he saying that Jesus defeated death, no. Right here, Peter's pointing his finger into the faces of these people and he's saying, you are the ones who killed him. You beat Jesus, you nailed Jesus to the cross, you killed Jesus, you did this. Beginning in verse 31, it says, seeing what was to come, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not abandoned in Hades and his flesh did not experience decay. God has raised this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. He's telling the crowd, not only did you kill Jesus, but you are witnesses to his resurrection. You know that Jesus was here. You know that Jesus was alive. You know that Jesus died, but you know he rose again. Verse 33 says, therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. But here's my favorite part of the story. You ready? Pay attention. Verse 37, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Man, what a day. What a day. You think your sins are so bad? You think your past is too rough? You think your mess-ups are so much that God can't forgive you? Well, in this story, Peter tells the people who beat Jesus, who whipped Jesus, who hung Jesus on the cross, the ones who killed Jesus, the one who crucified him firsthand, he's talking to them and he's saying, you can be forgiven and you can be saved. How? He says, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the grave so that sinners like you and sinners like me could be saved. He tells us to believe. He tells us to repent, to turn away. That's what that word repent means. It means to turn away from sin, to turn away from the path that you've been walking and to turn to God. And you put your trust in God now. You allow him to be the boss of your life from this moment forward. You say, well, God, I, I, I never want to be the same again. That's what repentance looks like. God, I want you to come into my life. I want you to save me and to change me and to forgive me. I want you to make me a brand new person. And from this point forward, my hope is in you. That, that's what it looks like to repent and believe. And he also goes on to say, and be baptized. See, baptism doesn't save you, but it gives you the opportunity to be obedient to God and to tell your salvation story in front of witnesses. The, the, the fact that you were lost and now you're found. You were blind and now you can see. You were walking in hopelessness and now you have the hope of Jesus Christ living inside of your heart. You were once a sinner on your way to hell. 
And now you've been saved by the grace of God. Acts chapter 2 verse 41 says, So those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day about 3,000 people were added to them. I wonder how many people watching today would say, man, I'm exactly where they were on that day. I'm ready to believe in Jesus. I'm ready to give my entire life to Jesus. I wonder how many people watching today are ready to turn away from the sin that they've been pursuing for so long and to do a 180 and finally chase Jesus with everything that they have. I wonder how many people watching today are ready to experience the hope that is only found through the person of Jesus Christ. So I believe with all my heart that there are people watching this today that need to make a decision for Christ. You need to repent of your sin. You need to believe in Jesus with your whole heart. And you need to be saved. You need to give your life to Jesus. You need to put your trust in him. You need to raise your flag for Christ and be baptized, showing everybody that you know that you are unashamed of the decision you've made to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Man, if that's the case, may I ask you a question? What can Satan throw at you right now that would prevent you from saying yes to Jesus? Maybe Satan could pick at your pride a little bit and say, no, you don't want to do this. What are gonna, people going to say? What are people going to think? Maybe Satan can put fear in your lap and make you fearful about what this decision is going to do to your life. Maybe you're thinking right now about a relationship that you have with someone that won't understand this decision or won't agree with you. Or maybe Satan's just going to remind you exactly how fun sin really is. Satan will do his very best to convince you today that you don't need Jesus. Remember, John 10.10 10 says he came to only steal and to kill and destroy. But don't forget what Jesus said about himself. He said, but I came to give you life and to give you life in abundance. My prayer today is that we would see hundreds of men and women and boys and girls that are ready to go all in with Jesus Christ. Go all in with Jesus Christ. In just a moment, if you know that I'm speaking to you today, I'm gonna to give you an opportunity to make that decision, but to make that decision public, even in this unique setting. In fact, I'm gonna ask you in just a moment to text me from your, from your cell phone. And you're gonna text us and, and my team so that we can connect with you and we can celebrate what God is doing in your life. See, we believe that God has called us as the church to, to lock arms with one another and to support one another, especially in, in, in the infancy of our new relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we're gonna connect with you and we're gonna pray with you and then we're gonna send you a free gift from our church that I believe will help you get started in your relationship with the Lord. You say, well, why do I have to make this decision public? Why can't I just sit here on my couch in my pajamas and make this decision in secret just between me and the Lord? You know why? Because Jesus tells you to go public, that's why. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, Jesus said, therefore, everyone who will acknowledge me before others I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. You say, well, I'm not really sure if I'm ready to go public with Jesus yet. I'm not sure if I'm really that committed to making this decision to follow Christ right now. Then you know what? This may not be your moment. Don't respond just to respond. It's not a prayer that saves you. It really is a heart that says, I'm ready to make Jesus my everything. So only say yes to Jesus today if you're ready to go all in with him. Only respond if you are completely unashamed of him and you really mean business with God today. If you're not there yet, I wanna encourage you to hit the time out and to continue praying about making that decision in your life. But if you're serious, if you're unashamed, you're ready and you're excited about God coming into your life and giving you a brand new start beginning right now, I'm gonna ask you to respond in just a moment. So get your phone out and get ready. But before we do that, before we respond, I want you to do one more thing. And this may seem kind of strange, but if you're sitting in a room with other people, I want you to take a brief moment and just ask the person on your left and the person on your right a serious question. Now don't go off the rails, don't make this a silly time in your house, but ask them a serious question 
Because the Lord may use your prompting in a unique way. Ask this question. Are you ready to go all in with Jesus today? Do you need to make that decision today? And let's just see how the people around us respond. Let's just make sure that the people around us, number one, know the Lord, and number two, are walking with the Lord today. You say, I'm ready to go all in with Jesus Christ. I know that. I know that this is my salvation moment where I go all in with Jesus and I trust him as not only my savior, but my Lord. I'm ready to make that decision right now. Can I invite you just to bow your head and to close your eyes? This isn't a magic prayer, but I do wanna lead you in a prayer that indicates what your heart is saying today. And if you mean these words, I invite you to repeat these words out loud in this moment. Just say, dear God, I know that I need you. I know that I have sinned and made decisions in my life that are not pleasing to you. But God, today, recognizing the fact that I can't save myself, that the only way for me to get to the Father is through the Son, Jesus, I ask you to save me. I ask you to step out of heaven and to step into my heart and to begin in this moment, changing me from the inside out. Make me a new creation. Make me the person you want me to be. Allow me to be a man of God, a woman of God, a child of God in the days to come and maximize my life for the kingdom of God. Lord, I love you and I acknowledge your love for me in this moment. God, I thank you for loving me so much. You sent your one and only son for me to, to die a death that I deserved and to pay a debt that I couldn't pay myself. God, I thank you for saving me today. I thank you for this, this brand new moment, this brand new life, and I can't wait to see what the future holds. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you just prayed that prayer and you meant it, unashamedly, I want you to take out your phone and type out the word saved, S-A-V-E-D. And I want you to send that word saved to the number 74784. Go to the messages in your phone, Type the number 74784 and in the message line, type the word saved. And in just a few moments, we're gonna have somebody connect with you. And they're going, to, they're going to talk to you about this decision to follow Christ. And they're going to talk about next steps as a believer. You know, one next step that the Bible just talked about is the step of baptism. It's a testimony to point everybody around you, point to everybody around you and to say, hey, this is the decision I've made. And from this point forward, my life is going to line up with the life of Jesus. And, and we are going to be one and the same. He is my Lord and he is my savior. If you haven't been biblically baptized since your moment of salvation, and you're ready to do that out of obedience to Jesus, I want you to type the word baptism and send it to that same number, 74784. Baptism to 74784. You know, there's a lot of people making decisions for Christ today. And I just want to know, is your heart beating out of your chest? In Revelation 3.20, Jesus said, here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. If anybody hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Let me ask you, is he knocking? Did you open up the door? Today is a special day. It is Easter. And we're reminded that Jesus is alive. But there's nothing greater than when Jesus is alive in us. God bless you. Happy Easter.